I found your child on the balcony, so I bought her here. In the middle of a freezing winter night, the doorbell rang. When I answered it, a police officer was standing there. I didn't understand what was happening. After all, my only daughter was sleeping beside me. The officer had him with a girl about five years old, her lips blue and shivering coldly. She's not my child, I don't know this girl. I tried to explain, but the officer seemed doubtful, saying he would take her to the hospital. The girl's hair was overgrown and completely unkept. Her dirty clothes had holes in them and they didn't look like they had been washed. She appeared the same age as my daughter but was very thin. Who is this child? Why was she on my balcony? Little did I know that the turmoil this girl would soon bring into our lives. My name is Janice. I'm a 32-year-old office worker. I lived on the first floor of an apartment that my parents bought for us with my high school classmate husband and our five-year-old daughter, Susie. My husband was also a company employee and often traveled for work. Being a good person, he would cover for his colleagues even on his days off, so he was often away. One day, while my husband was on a business trip, my daughter and I were home alone when the doorbell rang. In the middle of a freezing winter night, I wondered who it could be, and looking through the doorbell camera, I saw it was a police officer. I was baffled by this unexpected visitor, but when I opened the door, he said, I found your child on the balcony, so I have brought her here. I had no idea what he meant. Yes, my daughter is sleeping inside the house. What? The officer's eyes went wide, but I was the one who was really shocked. How had that girl gotten onto the balcony while I was asleep? I hadn't heard a thing. The officer had with him a girl about five years old, her lips blue and shivering uncontrollably. It had been so cold that it seemed like it might even snow, so it was no wonder. She's not my child, I don't know this girl. The officer seemed skeptical even after what I said, but he stated, I'm taking her to the hospital now. The girl looked so cold and pitiful that I brought a warm blanket from the back of the room and wrapped her in it. Her hands were like ice, so young, yet holding back tears and biting her lips without making a sound. Her hair was messy and her collar stained. Whole written clothes showed no signs of having been washed. She looked incredibly thin and pale as if she was malnourished. Who is this child? Why was she on my balcony? I couldn't help but wonder, and my heart ached thinking about a girl the same age as my daughter in such pain. I couldn't sleep much that night, worried about her. And morning came, that's when I got a call from my husband. Uh, anything unusual happened while I was on my business trip? Well, yes, a strange girl was on our balcony. The police took her and they're taking her to the hospital. I was so surprised. Why didn't you take care of her yourself? What? But she's a stranger. What could I do? You're a mother too, you should have taken care of that little girl instead of handing her over to the police, isn't it sad? I was baffled by my husband's sudden anger. Why did he know the girl was young? We hadn't even talked about that. I questioned him, but his answer was lacking in clarity. No, uh, actually she's the daughter of an acquaintance of mine. Her mother is gone and I felt sorry for her, so I brought her yesterday. I thought you would take care of her. What? Uh, you weren't on a business trip? You need to explain the situation clearly. My husband apologized, but I couldn't believe that he had left such a small child on the balcony on such a cold day. Even if he had dressed her warmly, she could have easily frozen to death. So what are you doing and where are you now? My husband said he was in the middle of searching for the girl's mother, but I felt like he was hiding something. Later on, after returning from his business trip, my husband gave some explanation, picked up the girl from the police, and shockingly left her with me. Did you find her mother? What about her father? Uh, no, uh, I haven't found them yet. Uh, the father? Uh, I don't know. So, who's the acquaintance you mentioned? Well, that's just a casual acquaintance. Um, let's leave it at that. I'm going on another business trip soon. Wait a minute, what about this girl? My husband ignored my plea to stay and left, leaving the girl behind. I felt something was off about my husband's behavior, so I searched through his belongings and found something in the inner pocket of his suit. 
Shocked by the content, I quickly called my husband but I couldn't get through to him. Suddenly, I noticed my daughter Susie and the little girl looking up at me anxiously. Um, what's your name? Ashley? Ashley, nervously answered in a small voice, told me she was the same age as my daughter, 5 years old. When I smiled gently at her, she looked at me with surprise, then laughed cheerfully, clutching her rumbling stomach. You must be hungry, right? Yes. I made Hawaiian plate lunches for my daughter and Ashley. They stared at the food in curiosity and then began to devour it. They ate so fast that their faces were covered in sauce. As I reached out to wipe her face with a tissue, Ashley quickly brought both hands to her head, covering it as if protecting herself. The motion gave me an uneasy feeling. It's alright, I'm just going to wipe your mouth, I said gently. With a relieved expression, Ashley turned her face towards me, and after I wiped up the sauce, she began to eat her Hawaiian plate again. After finishing her meal and wearing a completely satisfied expression, it was time to do something about Ashley's dirty body. As I started to undress her for a quick shower, I involuntarily gasped at the sight of her body. What is this? There were countless bruises as if she had been beaten and pinched. Trying not to show my agitation, I led her cheerfully to the bathroom. As I tried to wash her body, Ashley said, It's okay, I can do it myself, and started to wash her body with cold water. Wait a minute, what are you doing? I accidentally snapped. She looked up at me with a puzzled face and said, Ashley always does it like this. What? Washing your body with water? I asked. She nodded at my question and as she tried to pour cold water over herself, I hurriedly stopped her and washed her whole body cleanly with soap. Afterwards, I poured warm water over her and she murmured, It's warm, with a contented look. It turned out that she rarely got to shower at home and when she did, her mother would tell her to wash with water. The fact that she accepted this as normal without questioning, it made my heart ache. After the bath, I dressed her in my daughter Susie's clothes and neatly arranged her hair. Ashley looked completely transformed. My daughter and Ashley look just like sisters when they stand together. I looked at my daughter and Ashley, whose faces seemed to remind me of each other with a warm smile. Ashley was an obedient and gentle child, and I could tell she was longing for affection. She would come by my side as I cooked, tug at the edge of my skirt and laugh. And when it was time to sleep, she would hold my hand and never let it go. Susie also grew fond of Ashley and the two became close like real sisters. A week went by and I still couldn't get in touch with my husband. Ashley's mother said she knew my husband, but I couldn't keep caring for a little child on just that information. I gave up on contacting my husband, consulted the police, and Ashley had to be sent to a facility. Tears rolled down her big eyes and my heart ached watching her look back at me again and again as the people from the facility took her away. Time continued to pass without any news from my husband until I finally made a decision. Nine years later, I was living with my parents, my daughter Susie and Ashley in our family home. I had actually adopted Ashley after she was taken to the facility. My parents in our family home treated her like their real grandchild saying, she came to us for a reason, and showered her with love. The two girls grew up as sisters and blossomed into beautiful young women. Susie and Ashley's dream of becoming models came true and lately, they are being featured as beautiful junior models in magazines. Stepping into the glamorous world, the two were thriving and wore vibrant expressions on their faces. One day, the doorbell rang at our family home and when I opened the door, there stood my ex-husband, Philip, looking poor down and out. A stranger who introduced herself as Joanna was with him. Not wanting to argue in front of the neighbors, I let them inside. Then, sitting on the living room sofa, the two abruptly began to speak. Uh, in truth, Ashley is uh, my child. Philip, who hadn't contacted me in nine years, said this without even apologizing. I was so stunned that I let out a big sigh. She looks just like you. I thought it might be you, so is that woman over there your partner? In response to my question, Philip nodded and began to tell the story of how he met the woman. 
Joanna had been working part-time at a bar Philip frequently visited. Even knowing that he was married with children, they got along and she became pregnant with Philip's child, giving birth to Ashley. However, Philip lacked decisiveness and didn't divorce me right away. Joanna grew tired of childcare and abandoned her role as a mother. In desperation, Philip thought of having me raise the child. It was an overly naive story, but what surprised me was not just that. Please, give Ashley back to us. My ex-husband suddenly stood up from the sofa and made an outrageous request, almost in tears, along with a deep apology. What? I happened to see a magazine and was surprised. She's grown up so well, isn't she popular? So what? It has nothing to do with you two. But I am Ashley's real mother. You are just a fake after all. How dare you say such a thing without contacting me all this time? Then, Philip, who had been on his knees on the floor, grabbed my leg with a pathetic look on his face. We don't have any money and are in trouble. Ashley's our only hope. Give her back. How awful. You plan to make her work and live off her? No way. What? What? You're using Ashley to make money, aren't you? That's not fair. Stop making false accusations. I'm saving the children's money on their banking cards. Ashley is my child, too. I will never hand her over. Then, Joanna suddenly rises from the sofa, launching at me with an air of recklessness that sends shiver down my spine. What are you doing to my mom? Stop it. In the scene bursts Ashley, my daughter. She spreads her arms wide, blocking my path and glares at Joanna. Ashley, you've grown so beautiful. Remember me? I'm your mom. Let's go home together. You're not my mother. Get out of this house now. Ashley broke down in tears, clinging to me. Although Ashley was very young at the time, it seems a faint memory of the terrible treatment she endured remains. Ashley, dear, that's just a misunderstanding on your part. See, you were so young back then. In response to our flimsy excuses, I produced a note and photograph that I had found in Philip's suit back then. The note read, I don't want to raise a child. I can't find Ashley cute. Get rid of her somewhere. If you won't marry me, let's run away together. And the photograph showed a young Ashley covered in bruises. I also had the hospital medical report, of course. Do you still claim to be her parents after seeing this? That's... That's... You wanted to dump a child you didn't want to raise on me, did you? You made this precious child suffer such horrors. That was all Philip's doing. I didn't know anything about it. I was too young to raise a child. It was inevitable. But anyway, I'll take Ashley back now. Unfortunately... That's not going to happen. I have legally adopted Ashley, so I am her parent. Oh, what? That's... that has to be a lie. The mention of the law quickly deflated Joanna's momentum. However, Philip seemed to not have given up yet. So, if that's the case, I'll break up with Joanna and let's start over. Susie and Ashley are my children. We'll just go back to being husband and wife, so there won't be any problem, will there? Oh, what? What are you saying? You just want things to go your way like I will let that happen. Listening to their exchange, I was dumbfounded, then angry. I don't want to have anything to do with these people, not even for a moment. I have more bad news for you, Philip. You and I are no longer married. What? Three years after you went missing, I filed a lawsuit and was granted a divorce. Hey, what are you doing on your own? Just as Philip was about to grab me, the sound of a police car approached. My parents had called the police after seeing Joanna's aggressive behavior. Well, the police are here now, so please don't come to our house again. No way, please forgive me. I'll give up on Ashley, but at least lend me some money. Philip put on a disgraceful show to the very end. Afterwards, he and Joanna were dragged away by the police. I plan to make sure Philip pays the alimony and child support in full. The two of them, cut off even from friends and family, will likely continue to struggle. Though there's been much turmoil, the little girl who once trembled in fear has grown splendidly. I will live happily with my parents and two loving daughters, looking forward to the future they speak of so full of dreams.
Well, Mom, how about making sandwiches for us every day until you can get together $30,000? If you don't, I won't let you see Amelia anymore. Such an unreasonable demand from my eldest son turned my life upside down. Before dawn, I was making sandwiches for his family and delivering them, then heading to the care facility. Worn out from fatigue and lack of sleep, I just couldn't bring myself to cut ties with him. All because of my love for my adorable granddaughter, Amelia. But one day, a tearful Amelia revealed a shocking truth her parents had kept hidden. I can't forgive them anymore. I reached my breaking point and decided to fight back. My name is Emma, I am 72 years old. I lost my husband last year and now live alone in our family home. My husband, who was the same age as me, developed dementia in his later years. I took care of him at home for a while, but the last year was spent under the care of a facility. Because of that, I still have a connection to that facility, even after he's gone. I was mentally and physically exhausted from caregiving, and the staff at the facility were truly kind to me. Thanks to them, I believe my husband spent his last year in peace. The facility was always short-staffed and extremely busy. After my husband passed away, I talked to the staff and decided to help out in any small way I could. I've always been good at cooking and baking, so I would make sandwiches and desserts for the staff whenever I went to the facility. Then one day, out of the blue, my eldest son and his family came to visit. It took me by surprise, but I served them tea. Mom, it's been a while. Sorry for barging in like this. We've had some issues and decided to move to this area. James, my eldest son, said, while reaching for the treats on the table. He looked worn out for some reason. Natalie, my daughter-in-law, barely spoke since they arrived and kept fiddling with her cell phone. They decided to move all of a sudden? Did something happen? A faint unease lingered in my heart, but I greeted my granddaughter Amelia with a smile. Amelia, you've grown up so much. How have you been? It must have been about five years since I last saw my eldest son's family. Ever since my husband was diagnosed with dementia, my days were consumed with caregiving, leaving no time or energy for anything else. I couldn't even keep up with my adorable Amelia. Granny, it's been a while. I've been good. I'm in the ninth grade now. Oh my, how time flies. You'll be taking exams this year then. You better do your best. Upon hearing this, Amelia's expression turned somber. I wondered, is moving during such a critical period in her education a good idea? Just then, a cat's meow echoed from the kitchen. Amelia whispered with joy, A cat? and hurried towards the sound. Mom, since when did you get a cat? No, that little kitty just pops in from time to time. I always leave the back door slightly ajar for her. Sounds risky. James was staring intently towards the kitchen. Natalie didn't lift her face from her smartphone. In Amelia's absence, I probed my son and his wife about the reasons behind their move. Their response was vague, but in essence, they moved hastily due to financial troubles stemming from a failed business venture. I then inquired about James's job. Job? Well, things have been rough. My health's been on the decline and the doctor advised some rest. More importantly, Mom, I have a favor to ask. James was hoping for a loan. The failed business and move drained their finances and they were nearly out of money. He needed about $5,000 for daily expenses. Honestly, I hesitated. Even though he's my eldest, lending such a large sum on the spot felt daunting. Are the two of them even thinking about their future? But no matter how much I probed, all I got was, just lend us the money. Despite my reservations, I took out $5,000 from my savings and handed it to James. With a smirk, James quickly pocketed the money. Well, do your best for Amelia's sake. If there's anything I can do to help, just let me know. Yeah, thanks. We're heading out now, but we'll be around often. Please keep some food ready for us. With that, James called Amelia, who was petting the cat in the kitchen, and the three of them left. As I cleared the dishes, a sense of unease about what the future held settled in. Hey mom, it's me. I'll be coming over tonight. 
have dinner and a bath ready, okay? Oh, and I've run out of the money you gave me, so I'll need a bit more. Later. Without waiting for my response, James hangs up the phone. I sigh heavily and set my immobile phone on the table. It's been two weeks since my eldest son's family imposed themselves on me. Since then, James has been coming over almost daily for meals and money. On weekends, his adorable daughter Amelia joins. At first, I prepared special meals and lent him a few thousand dollars each time, but I reached my limit. James claimed he couldn't work due to medical reasons, but he looked perfectly healthy to me. I couldn't understand why he was blowing through the large sums I lent him every week. That evening, fed up, I sternly confronted James and his wife when they arrived. I told them I didn't want them visiting so frequently and to stop asking for food and money. What? You said you'd help, didn't you? Was that a lie? Predictably, James became aggressive in his words and demeanor. His wife, Natalie, silently played with her phone while eating the meal I'd prepared. There are limits, you know. Making me prepare meals every day? Asking for money every week? Enough is enough. I'll go bankrupt at this rate. Fine. I'll give up on the money for now, but instead, bring me sandwiches every day. Enough for three meals. What? I can't do that. I've told you I volunteer at a facility every weekday morning. Then drop them off before you go. Wake up at 3 a.m. if you have to. Before I could respond, James added, If you don't do anything for us, you won't see Amelia anymore. We'll cut ties with you. Knowing how much I adore my only granddaughter Amelia, James smirked. Honestly, I'd love to cut ties with this couple, but I worry about sweet Amelia. Let me think. I can't come up with money that easily. Then at least gather around $30,000 for now. And remember the sandwiches daily. Let's go, Natalie. From now on, we don't have to come here every day since Mom will deliver our sandwiches. From that day on, my life dramatically changed. I would wake up before dawn to prepare sandwiches for James's family, deliver them, and then head to the facility. Exhausted and sleep-deprived, my love for Amelia stopped me from cutting ties with my son. This exhausting routine continued for about a month. Then, unexpectedly, Amelia visited alone one weekend. I greeted her with a smile, but she looked somber. To be honest, Dad told me not to visit you anymore. Amelia confessed as she gently stroked our family cat in the kitchen. They make you prepare sandwiches every day while they just laze around at home. I'm so sorry. You don't need to apologize, Amelia. Well, I am a bit worried about those two, but... How's the new school? Are you keeping up with your studies? I tried to shift the topic with a cheerful tone, but Amelia remained silent, tears streaming down her face. Caught off guard, I comforted her by rubbing her back. Eventually, she broke down crying even louder. Not understanding the reason, I patiently waited for Amelia to calm down. When she finally stopped crying, she revealed a shocking truth. Amelia hadn't been attending middle school since they moved here. Not just that, she claimed James forced her to lie about her age and work several part-time jobs. All the money she earned went straight into James's pocket. Furthermore, James took away her cell phone when they moved. One night, he suddenly said, We're moving! And she was forced onto a truck without even saying goodbye to her friends or teachers. James had forcefully made her promise not to tell me, her grandmother, about all this. I was dumbfounded by the shocking revelations pouring from Amelia's tear-filled eyes. It seemed as if they had moved, secretly, in the dead of night. What could have possibly happened to my eldest son and his wife? That's how it was. Amelia, you've been struggling all this time. I'm sorry I didn't notice earlier, but thank you for telling me. No, I should apologize. I didn't want to upset you. You know, I overheard Dad and Mom talking about you yesterday. They were planning to secretly take some sort of property deed from your place and then pretend you have dementia to place you in a facility. I just couldn't hold it in anymore.
Unable to hold back, Amelia began to cry again. I hugged her tightly. No matter what, I couldn't forgive my eldest son anymore. Until now, I endured everything for dear Amelia's sake, but I've reached my breaking point. James is clearly an adult and a parent himself. He must face the consequences of his actions. I made up my mind silently. Amelia, you don't need to worry. Leave everything to me. Oh, by the way, where are you planning to take your school entrance exams? I smiled at Amelia, trying to encourage her. Amelia, her eyes red from crying, looked a little comforted. Well, I want to go to a place called Winchester Culinary School. With everything going on and lack of money, I might not even be able to apply. Oh, the Winchester Culinary School! I know it. It's a vocational school for cooking and baking, right? The person who founded it was in the same class as your grandfather and me. It's a good school. Really? That's amazing! I love the dishes you make. I want to make people smile with my cooking, just like you. After that, Amelia shared her dreams with me. She told me that despite her tough circumstances, she never gave up and continued studying diligently. I encouraged Amelia and made her promise to continue her studies. After seeing Amelia off, I quickly took action. First, I decided to investigate my eldest son and his wife, so I hired a private investigator. A week later, after receiving the investigation results and pondering them, I made several contacts. Once everything was in order, I called James. I have something substantial to give him. He must bring Natalie and Amelia with him. Thinking he'd finally get his hands on the big bucks, James eagerly agreed to the conditions, deciding to meet at a coffee shop over the weekend. I was seated by the coffee shop's window, engrossed in my phone, when James and his family approached. I set my phone down on the table and exchanged greetings. Hey, give me the money already. Do you want to be cut off from us? Immediately, James reached for the thick brown envelope by my side, filled to the brim. Pulling the envelope closer, I held on to it, firmly. If you really want, we can sever ties. But before that, I have some things to confirm with you. Only after that will I hand this over. I began by pointing out that ever since their move, they hadn't enrolled Amelia in middle school and had been making her work illegally on the side. The couple tried to brush it off, clearly eager for the money, but eventually admitted the truth. We had no money, so we had no choice. Once we get the money, she'll quit her job and go back to middle school. Suspicious. With doubt, I continued to question why James wasn't working. Are you truly on medical leave? Which hospital did you go to? Show me some proof, like a receipt or a health insurance card. I don't have any. You're not faking it, are you? Lying just because you don't want to work? As the atmosphere grew tense, James raised his voice. Don't say things like that! I didn't go to any hospital, but something really traumatic happened and it's been hard. James, can you honestly tell me what happened? If you do, I'll give you this. When I motioned to the envelope in my hand, James begrudgingly began to speak. I get it now. When you said your business failed last time, you were actually betrayed by a business partner, a guy named Alexander. He took off with all the money I worked so hard to earn. He had control over the core know-how and equipment, so I was powerless without him. Oh, that's what happened. I'm the victim here! That's why I couldn't pay the rent and other bills and had to move. Now just give me that money already. With that, James snatches the envelope from my grasp. However, when he quickly opens it, instead of a wad of cash, it's filled with a bunch of bills. James stares blankly at the bills scattered across the table. Why don't you just tell the truth for once? Feeling let down by my eldest son's persistence in lying, I reveal the facts I've gathered. As the business started to profit, he got deep into the sex industry, accumulating massive debt. 
To cover it, he deceived his business partner, took all the earnings, and even got involved with payday lenders. Then, he moved away secretly in the middle of the night. Do you have any idea how hard it was for Amelia? She was thrown into chaos without understanding the reason. She couldn't even say goodbye to her friends and teachers. And you took away her phone? Do you understand how scared and hurt she felt? Whether James was listening or not, he desperately searches the bills, hoping to find money. Watching his pitiable state, I was utterly exasperated. James, hiding from payday lenders and business owners, had neither been working nor notifying the proper authorities of his whereabouts or processing school transfers for Amelia. His wife, Natalie, wasn't working either, so they had no income. It's clear they were counting on me from the beginning. No, I was planning to work once things settled down. What exactly did you do? All you've done is demand money and meals from me and force Amelia to work, right? Natalie is always on her phone, not working at all. Also, I know you've been sneaking into my house while I'm gone. That's breaking and entering, a serious crime, you know. I always leave the back door open for the neighborhood cats. Knowing this, James had been repeatedly breaking into my house whenever I was away. The day Amelia told me about James and Natalie, I remembered I had a pet camera I'd won in a raffle. I fetched it from the storage and set it up. Sure enough, the footage showed James sneaking in from the back door while I was away, rummaging through my cupboards. I've saved the footage on my mobile phone. So, after getting hold of the deeds to my house and land, you plan to make it seem like I'd lost my mind put me in a facility, and then snatch everything away. You moved here with that intent from the beginning, didn't you? Shut up! You keep making me out to be a criminal! Just because you're my mother, you think you can make baseless accusations? I have a witness, right here. Suddenly, an intimidating male voice sounded from behind. James, upon seeing the man, was shocked and jumped. What? Alexander? Why are you- Emma contacted me. I heard there was a discussion today, so I came from far away to participate. Good to see you, James. Looking well, I see. Saying so, Alexander took a seat next to James, effectively blocking his exit. It's my first time meeting him, but Alexander is quite an imposing middle-aged man. I'm surprised James dared to cross someone like him. James, return the money now. There are officers waiting outside. I filed a police report. Pay up or turn yourself in. Decide now. Hearing this from Alexander, James hurriedly looked towards the window. Just as Alexander said, a police car was parked right outside the diner, with an officer standing there, looking our way while on his phone. James looked shocked by the scene, his eyes wide as he instinctively moved back in his seat. Wait! Alexander, I, I was wrong! I'm truly sorry. I'll pay you back, I promise. I wasn't running away. I just needed a little more time. Just a bit longer, please. Maybe another two weeks? So you plan to sneak out in the middle of the night and move again? You think I trust the words of someone who's lied to me once? I'll ask one more time, will you return the $30,000 you stole from me now, or will you go to the officer outside? Which is it? Finally, he'd be arrested. A tangible, profound fear overtook James, sweat forming on his brow. Trembling, James just stared at the table silently for a moment. Eventually, James's bloodshot eyes slowly turned to face me. Hey, Mom! Are you okay with this? If I get arrested, Amelia will be the daughter of a criminal! Your meddling has ruined your sweet granddaughter's life! If you don't want that, give me the money! Alexander, I'm sorry to interrupt, but could I borrow your cell phone? Mine isn't working right now. I need to dial this number. Cutting off James's desperate plea, I abruptly addressed Alexander. Ignoring the dumbfounded James, I took the phone that Alexander handed over willingly and dialed a number. 
Switching the call to speaker mode, I placed the phone on the table. Amelia, I'm calling the Dean of the Winchester Culinary School. I've already briefed him about your situation. Please, have a chat with him. Amelia was visibly flustered. What? Uh... Shortly, the call connected, and a flustered Amelia picked up the phone. A deep, calm male voice came through from the other end. Hello, this is William. Oh, hi! My name's Amelia. I... I love my grandma's... um, my grandmother's cooking. And I want to be able to make dishes that bring joy to people, too. I want to join the Winchester Culinary School. It was a call with the dean of the prestigious Winchester Culinary School. Amelia, filled with nervous excitement, tried her best to convey her feelings. Dean William listened intently, occasionally nodding and giving encouraging murmurs. I see. Thank you for sharing, Amelia. It seems you've been through a lot. Your grandmother, Emma, is an old friend of mine. I'm aware of the situation. Amelia, once so excited, suddenly went silent. That's right, she had no hope for exams or the future. Like a deflating balloon, her shoulders slumped in disappointment. But you know, that doesn't matter. You have dreams and you're working hard towards them. You've honored our Winchester Culinary School by choosing it as your first step. We give everyone an equal chance and support all students, no matter their background. Come, take the test with integrity. We'll be waiting. The call ended. I thanked him and handed the mobile phone back to Alexander. Yes, Amelia will be fine now. I can turn myself in without any worries. James's face went blank, and he froze. For those who might not know, the Winchester Culinary School is where Amelia wants to study. It's a professional cooking school. Despite the challenges from her clueless parents, nothing will hold her back. Amelia looked at her father. Her cheeks were still flushed from the tension of the call, but her eyes sparkled. James looked deflated, avoiding eye contact, clearly embarrassed. Prompted by Alexander, James exited the diner. The officer put away his phone and started talking to James. It's disheartening to see your child in police custody, but I want James to take full responsibility for his actions. I picked up the mobile phone, left on the table. I had previously consulted with the officer and had him on the line during our conversation. With everything recorded, even James can't escape this time. And one more thing. I turned to Natalie. Throughout the confrontation with James, she seemed disinterested, constantly fiddling with her phone. Natalie? James is with the officer. What will you do? She only briefly met my gaze. Huh? I don't care about that man. I'm divorcing him soon anyway. Amelia looked shocked and turned to her mother. Wait, what about Amelia? Your marital issues are yours, but you need to consider Amelia. I've made up my mind about what I want. I'm tired of his wasteful spending. I just want to live on my terms now. Tears quickly filled Amelia's eyes. With a father like James and now her mother... How much more hurt would they inflict on their daughter? I felt more disheartened than angry and sighed deeply. Later, a resigned James confessed all his crimes at the police station and is still being interrogated. He owed $50,000 from the sex industry, took $30,000 from his former business partner Alexander, and borrowed $20,000 from payday lenders. The total amount he siphoned from me was around $20,000. Of course, both Alexander and I intend to claim every penny. As his mother, it's heartbreaking. I hope this serves as a lesson for him to deeply reflect and atone for his sins. Natalie, being James's ex-wife, was also interrogated. During this, it was discovered she had been scammed. This was a romance scam, where you get sweet-talked by someone you meet on social media, and after establishing a romantic relationship, they skillfully swindle large amounts of money. The person Natalie had been communicating with on her mobile phone claimed to be a super-famous, handsome actor. 
One day, she received a personal direct message just for her and was passionately pursued. Natalie fell head over heels. She kept sending money, doing whatever he asked. Of course, this was an imposter, pretending to be the actor. This case mirrored numerous others reported to the police. Realizing she'd been deceived, Natalie was utterly devastated. Since she had already divorced James, she had no one to turn to and had lost her means of livelihood. After that, I decided to live with Amelia. I sold my house and land and moved to an apartment near Winchester Culinary School. The house and land, located in a prime urban area, had a huge asset value, fetching me several million dollars. I made sure that Amelia would be the beneficiary of these assets so she'd never face financial hardships. We moved in the middle of the night, as if sneaking away. My parents were deeply distressed with everything escalating to the police, but Amelia never gave up and continued to work hard. I too did everything I could, managing her transfer to middle school and helping with her exams. Thanks to our efforts, Amelia managed to take the entrance exam for Winchester Culinary School and got in. Just as Principal Williams said, Amelia dedicates herself to her studies at Winchester Culinary School, heading straight towards her dream, enjoying her youthful days surrounded by friends. Watching my beloved Amelia grow up by my side, I live with peace in my heart, basking in happiness. Excuse me, but my card doesn't seem to be working. We urge you to sell your outstanding balance promptly. Otherwise, your card will remain unusable. What? The call center operator from the card company had indeed mentioned outstanding balance. It seems that the payment from my usual credit card hasn't gone through yet. Uh, why though? I should have a substantial amount saved in the account linked for automatic payments. But upon checking my bank account, the balance read zero dollars. The only other person who could have withdrawn money from it would be my husband. So I reached for my mobile phone and immediately reported it to the police. My name is Garnet Felton and I'm 30 years old. I work at my own pace as a freelance web designer. Since my job allows me to work from home, I often visit clients directly for meeting. While most of the meetings could technically be held online, I prefer talking to clients in person to relay my ideas. When a deadline approaches, I work long hours and often forego sleep. The reason I can keep up with this job is due to my husband's support. I got married to Thomas a year ago. A few years back, when I was assigned to a project at a company, he was the representative I spoke with. We were in a relationship for a year and a half before we got married. After our marriage, he moved into my apartment. Despite all this, there's one major problem in my life which concerns Thomas's parents. They are a bit casual with their spending and always seem to be short on money. Thomas and I split all our living expenses. Since I earn more, I usually pay all the expenses for the month and then he reimburses me half at the beginning of the next month. However, when I informed Thomas about this month's expenses as usual, he grimaced and said, Listen, money's a bit tight this month. Can I pay my share of the living expenses after my next paycheck? What? Uh, what do you mean by tight? I'm only asking for half of the living expenses. Yeah, I know, but I'm totally out of cash until the next payday. What do you mean? It's only been 10 days since payday. Well, I have some stuff to take care of for my parents. For your parents? His evasive attitude and refusal to explain clearly began to frustrate me. His intentional vagueness made me probe further. Hey, uh, can you explain properly why can't you pay? And what's this about taking care of your parents? Well, that is... Is there something you're guilty about? No, not at all. I just helped out my mom and dad. Helped out? Yes, they said they were struggling, so I just sent them some money. Thomas's parents are supposed to be working. My father-in-law had a full-time job, and my mother-in-law works part-time, so why did he need to send them money? 
I couldn't quite wrap my head around this and asked the question that had been gnawing at me. Why do your parents need financial aid even though they are working? There was never any need for this before? I have been sending them money all along. They just asked me to increase the amount starting this month. You didn't actually agree to increase the amount, did you? Yes, I did. What's the issue? If my parents are in trouble, it's natural to help them out. Fine. Just make sure to pay when you get your paycheck at the end of the month, okay? My husband can be quite stubborn once he set his mind to something. I love him, but his obstinate side does cause some issues. I didn't think saying more would change his mind, nor would he genuinely apologize. I decided to hold off on pressing further and wait patiently until the next payday. Ever since that incident, he began finding excuses not to contribute to our household expenses. Even if he did contribute, it was only about a third of the amount. It's been almost six months since he started refusing to pay. While we're still technically married, my patient is wearing thin. Even though I'm bearing all the expenses, all the household chores are also up to me. Thinking about it made me feel foolish and overwhelmed with emptiness. One late night, he came home. His face was flushed, clearly tipsy. I couldn't help but raise my voice. Hey, if you are going to be out drinking, why didn't you call? I made dinner and waited for you. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> A colleague invited me out unexpectedly. <laughs> but you could at least send a message, right? I've told you before to let me know. Ah, oh, don't yell as soon as I get home. Feels unwelcome. What's that supposed to mean? Why am I the one getting blamed? He looked at me with disdain as if I was the bad guy. I was infuriated by his attitude and confronted him. Why can you afford to go out drinking when you can't even pay our bills? I can have a drink once in a while. I'm tired from working every day. So am I. I do all the household chores. If you can't contribute anymore, can we stop sending money to your parents? What? Why? This is my family's matter. It's none of your business. What about us, Thomas? Aren't we family too? What am I to you living here with you after we got married? Oh, so annoying. What does it matter? You make more money than I do anyway. Why is he acting so superior? The only reason Thomas can live comfortably is because I am covering all the bills. Wouldn't a simple thank you or sorry for the inconvenience be appropriate? I was at a loss for words facing his unreasonable arguments. I couldn't comprehend how he could be so arrogant. Given our heated tempers, I figured a calm discussion wasn't possible and said, let's talk again tomorrow. The next day, as I prepared dinner, waiting for him, I heard the front door open. Welcome home. I called from the kitchen, but there was no reply. Then the living room door opened and in walked my husband with his parents. Um, mom? Dad, why are you here? With a smug grin, my husband said, My parents have something they want to discuss with you. Discuss with me? Come on, Mom and Dad, get straight to the point, huh? <laughs> Encouraged by my husband, my father-in-law began looking apologetic. Sorry uh, for the sudden visit. Uh, we came to discuss the money Thomas uh, has been sending us. Uh, what's this about? Uh, Garnet, can you please stop tormenting uh, Thomas? Taking it back, I blurted out, What? I was utterly bewildered. Then my mother-in-law, who had been quiet, spoke up. Garnett, Thomas has been sending us money every month thinking of our well-being. It's unfair for you to blame him. What are you talking about? Harassment? Blame? All I want is for our living expenses to be paid properly. Listen, Garnett, I hate to say this, but we are like in-laws to you, right? If your family's struggling, wouldn't you want to help? What? That's what anyone would think, right? Your father-in-law and I, we have been tied on money recently, so we expect Thomas to continue sending us money. That means you should cover the living expenses for both of you. They seemed to think it was only natural for me to cover all the costs. Not able to stand it anymore, I told them off. Enough is enough. What do you think I am, doing all the housework and covering all the living expenses? How is that fair? It's what married couples do, isn't it? What? Married couples support each other, right? Or are you just that greedy? Hearing his mother's provocation, my husband next to me couldn't help but laugh. 
That night, no matter what I said, they didn't listen. They only left after 9 p.m. After they left, my husband suddenly handed me a signed divorce paper. In disbelief, I asked, what is this? It means exactly what it looks like. Looking down at me, he said, If you keep defying me, I'll divorce you. Are you serious? Of course. If you don't want to divorce, just do as you're told. Your role is to follow, not lead. I should have stood up for myself, but I was too drained. Maybe it's pointless talking to Thalmas. Before the burden grows, maybe I should consider divorce too. Making up my mind was quick. The next day, I signed the divorce papers Thomas gave me and headed to the city hall. The papers were accepted and just like that, I was single again. Now, I'm free. I'll move out and start living on my own soon. Feeling refreshed, I decided to go shopping at the department store. Since I usually work from home and only go out for meetings, it's been a while since I shopped for myself. Especially recently since I had to cover all the expenses, I hadn't been able to buy anything for myself. Today, I'm going to treat myself. With that thought, I headed to the woman's clothing section. I tried on a few dresses and decided to buy two. At the checkout, when I handed over my credit card, the cashier gave me a travel look. Uh, I'm sorry, ma'am. It seems we can't use this card. Uh, what? That can be. We've tried a few times, but it just won't process. That's impossible. The last time I used the card was to buy a new tablet for work. I had no problems with online payment then, so why now? Rushing home, I decided to call the card company. After explaining the situation to the operator, she gave me shocking news. We need you to pay the outstanding amount immediately or your card will be unusable. What? Outstanding amount? Yes, as of last month, we couldn't deduct the card's usage from your account. That's impossible. Please check your bank account balance. After hanging up the phone, I checked my bank account online to see the balance which my card draws funds from. I've been using this account for savings since I was single, but now it's solely for my card's transaction. If I remember correctly, there should be $5 million in there, but my balance showed zero. Just before the card's due date, all $5 million was withdrawn. What's going on? Why? A chilling suspicion crossed my mind. Could it have been Thomas? But who else could it be? Our bank book and ATM card are kept together, accessible only to the both of us. Meaning Thomas was the only other person who could withdraw from my account? I waited for him to come home, then confronted him. Hey, did you take money from my account? He smirked, exhales loudly and responded, seeming quite annoyed. Oh, you found out? Thought I did a pretty good job hiding it, huh? I can't believe it. Why would you do that? Why? For my parents, obviously. I gave them your $5 million. What did you just say? Like I said, they asked for financial support. Lucky for them, I have a financial source. Financial source? Lost for words, he started explaining with a proud tone. It seemed his parents had been obsessed with shopping online recently. They kept buying stuff that they liked. Their spending was way beyond their income. Up until now, they had been asking Thomas for financial support, but now they were at a point where they couldn't manage anymore. Things escalated when they realized they could demand more. They started buying multiple of the same items and gave them away to neighbors. Before they knew it, their monthly payment was over $500,000 and Thomas couldn't cover it anymore, so he withdrew the $5 million from my account. Once he was done explaining, he said, You shouldn't have any complaints, right? They're also your family. Think of it as taking care of them. Stop fussing about a mere $5 million. In that moment, I found myself dialing the police on my cell. Hello? Police? I want to report a break-in and theft. My address is... Thomas watched me with wide eyes. As I ended the call, he shouted, Hey, who did you just call? Didn't you hear? The police. P -p -p police w Why would you call them? A and break in and theft? That's you, right? What? Calling a theft is way over the top. And break in? This is my house. I sternly told the flustered Thomas, we are not a couple anymore. Actually, I'm the one renting this place, so technically it's not your home, is it? We're not a, a couple? 
Remember the divorce papers you so kindly filled out yesterday? I already submitted them. So in other words, this is my place and you are just a stranger here, an intruder, right? You've got to be kidding me. Call them back and cancel the report. Waving my phone at him angrily, I threatened. If you lay a finger on me, I'll call the cops again. Just so you know, they're already on their way. You can't run now. Why don't you just admit what you have done? Whoa, wait, we loved each other, didn't we? Why is this happening? Loved each other? I scoffed. Don't give me that crap. Whose fault do you think all of this is? It all started because you blindly supported your reckless parents. You can't just do as you please and expect to be forgiven. Who would forgive someone as awful as you? What a fool. Fool? Who do you think you're talking to? To you? Like parents, like child, because you were raised by parents who were careless with money. You think it's okay to empty someone else's savings? I hope the police give you a good lecture and you will feel the weight of that five million dollars. Just then, the police arrived and Thomas crumbled on the spot. Uh, who's the person in question? Pointing at my husband now cowering on the floor, I said, It's him. Alright, get out. We'll need to take you in for questioning. Uh, all I wanted w was to care for my parents. But his pleas went unanswered and Thomas was taken away by the police. However, the incident was deemed a civil matter and the police informed me that they couldn't intervene. So I visited a law firm and demanded compensation for the misused savings of $5 million plus damages, totaling $6 million. Of course, Thomas and his parents didn't have that kind of money. In the end, all three ended up in debt. Despite their financial struggles, his parents continued their impulsive shopping sprees, leading to an ever-growing debt. They even turned to loan sharks. Rumors has it they now live in fear of daily debt collection, trying to stay hidden. On the other hand, I decided to completely cut ties with Thomas and moved to a new apartment. Thankfully, my work started flourishing and I now earn more than I could have ever imagined. After breaking up with Thomas, everything in my professional life fell into place. I wished I had divorced him earlier. Even though my marriage was a failure, I knew my life was far from over. Learning from this mistake, I am determined to be more cautious in the future. Our grandson is coming home, so let's have steak again today. Right now, hurry up and order the catering. At my in-law's house, we order steak through catering once a month as a treat. All right, shall we eat? Um, what about mine? How many times has this happened now? Every time they don't prepare a steak for me. My mother-in-law just lets me place the order and once I've fulfilled the trouble, there is no steak for me. My mother-in-law is very assertive and I just can't stand up to her. I guess I'll just have to put up with it again. Just when I was about to give up. Grandma's really mean, isn't she? What? My name is Raina. I'm a 38-year-old housewife. Having no particular talents, I used a matchmaking service and met my current husband, Craig. I wanted to get married but was struggling to find a good match, so the matchmaking service was my last hope. I was almost resigned to giving up but then I met a man who shared my love of movies. That man is now my husband. We hit it off on a movie date, had a smooth courtship and got married. My husband, being two years older, was kind. But that kindness disappeared when our son was born. Our marriage had grown cold when two changes occurred. The first was our son's IQ which suddenly soared as he grew. By third grade, he could handle subjects at an eighth grade level. Moreover, our son who loved reading was able to speak five languages by fifth grade. However, his intelligence led to bullying and he stopped attending school. Thanks to an opportunity to study abroad suggested by his teacher, he's now studying at Cambridge University in England. The second change was moving into my in-law's house when our son went abroad. My husband's work location changed so we moved into his parents' house, which was closer. Having become a housewife after marriage, I had no choice but to follow my husband. Little did I know this would be the beginning of a difficult life. 
My mother-in-law was the only one living at the in-law's house when we moved in. My father-in-law is in the hospital due to illness. I am not feeling very well, so I need you, young one, to work hard for me. That's what I was told on my first day living in my husband's family home. But my mother-in-law doesn't seem sick at all. She even seems more energetic than me. Uh, hey, uh, how old are you, mother-in-law? 64 this year. My husband answers my question with a hint of annoyance. Really? But she doesn't look sick at all. In this house, whatever mom says is the law. Don't you dare question her or you'll be in trouble. Upon hearing those words from my husband, I suddenly felt incredibly alone. I could clearly sense my mother-in-law's hostility towards me, but I never thought my husband would abandon me like this, even though our marriage had gone cold. Come on, Ryan, I'll get to work. You'll be staying here, so first clean the floors uh, with this mop. With that, I was handed an old mop and bucket. Looking around, I noticed dust accumulated everywhere. It was clear the cleaning hadn't been thorough. Uh, can I start using the vacuum cleaner? I thought to tackle the dust first. Don't rely on modern tools. Just do it all with the mop. Despite having a vacuum cleaner in the house, my mother-in-law refused to let me use it. I gave in and obediently replied, Understood. Could you do that part while I do this one? I thought we would clean together, so I asked my husband, but my mother-in-law interrupted with a contemptuous look. What are you talking about? Craig and I will chat and rest here. You clean by yourself. But... The house is unnecessarily big with six beds, three baths. It was impossible for me to clean it all alone. Also, do the dishes that have piled up, please. I was already at my limit with the floor cleaning and now she was adding more demands. I can't handle it all. The house is too big. Oh, really? Then I'll allow you to use the vacuum for $10 every 10 minutes. How's that? That's too expensive. You can't even pay $10. What a poor daughter-in-law. My husband didn't lift a finger to help me even as I was being mercilessly belittled in front of him. Moreover, he said, It looks bad to squat and talk while mopping. When it was just the two of us living together, the lack of conversation was manageable. But since coming to his parents' house, my husband's cold behavior had turned into something like psychological abuse. Let's have steak today. I know a delicious place. With that, my mother-in-law called for catering. My arms ached, but I somehow finished the cleaning and dishes. And right when I finished, the catered steak arrived. I worked hard for this. I was beyond excited for the steak. Ever since I heard that we would be ordering steak, I put extra effort into cleaning. My mother-in-law said it was going to be an expensive steak, and I couldn't help but wonder just how delicious it would be. My stomach seemed to growl just thinking about it. Raina, please pour some water. My mother-in-law's tone was commanding and cold, but I could endure it all for this moment. I absolutely love steak, especially filet mignon. Once I finished pouring the water, the ordered steaks were lined up on the table. Oh, wow, it looks delicious. Thank you, mother-in-law. I thanked her with joy. Huh? What are you talking about? There's no way there's any for you. My mother-in-law responded with a puzzled face. What? What do you mean, there is none? I felt my heart sink to rock bottom. I cleaned the floors as you asked and I have done the dishes. I said weakly only for my mother-in-law to retort. That's only natural. It was merely a token of appreciation for letting you stay. Think of it as paying a fee through your actions. Did you think you could live here for free? I had moved into my in-law's house due to my husband's work, and it was already nothing short of hell. Yet, I didn't have the money to live on my own. Since getting married, I only received $200 a month for allowance. After buying clothes, cosmetics, and necessities, I cannot save. My savings before meeting my husband were spent on moving expenses and my father's surgery. I thought I would at least be secure as a housewife. I realized how naive I had been. So what about my dinner? My mother-in-law seemed completely unprepared for that question and began pondering. Hmm, oh, uh, let me think. I felt hurt and questioned my word. There are some noodles around, you can eat those. The table held high-quality steaks, 
and my meal was noodles? This dark difference told the story of my place in this family. They both ate their steaks in silence, never offering me a bite. Reina, wash this knife and fork thoroughly. The only time I came close to the steak was when I washed the knife and fork after they were done eating. From the very first day, I endured horrible mistreatment and I was mentally and physically exhausted. One day, during this never-ending cycle, a call came from our son who was studying abroad. Mom, long time no see. Hey, you were good at handcrafts, right? Uh, what's this all of a sudden? I wouldn't say I'm good at it, but I do embroidery as a hobby. Really? Handcrafts are trendy here in America now, and I was reminded of your work. There are specialty stores here, but even looking back now, the quality of your embroidery is on another level. My son praised me during this rare phone call. How long has it been since someone praised me? I couldn't help but feel happy and even shed a few tears. Thank you. Only Leo would say something like that to me. My emotions must have transmitted to my son because he said, Mom, is something wrong? Your voice is trembling. What? My son is learning psychology in school, it seems. He said he has perfectly memorized all human unconscious actions that tie to mental states. Already a high IQ son, he has been further honed by receiving quality education. Now, they say his IQ is even measured at 200. Even as his mother, I can't believe he's the same person. Thanks to that, he has completely seen through my heart. Did something happen with dad? I remained silent for a moment, then gathered my courage to tell my son about the situation at my in-laws' house. I felt shameful as a parent, but I was grateful to have someone nearby to talk to. So, uh, it's tough every day. When I finished my story, he said, I'll come home once. It's our vacation and I have saved up some money from my part-time job. I insisted that everything was fine, but he wouldn't listen and my son is coming home soon. Time flew during our long overdue phone call and an hour had passed. Feeling rejuvenated, I thanked my son and hung up. When the call ended, my mother-in-law approached me with a glare. That's quite a luxurious long phone call. The energy I gained from my son slowly depleted as I dealt with my mother-in-law. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. More importantly, we're having a block party at our house tomorrow. Take care of the shopping. With that, my mother-in-law handed me a long list of items and left. At the end of the note, it said, Make a reservation for steak catering. Then came the day of the block party. People started to gather afternoon and before I knew it, there were ten. Everyone calls my mother-in-law the president. Come on, Rhino. What are you doing? Serve juice to everyone, she ordered. Mother-in-law who used me no matter who was around. Lauren, don't overwork the girl. It's pitiful. You should treat your daughter-in-law more kindly. Some did stand up for me against my mother-in-law's harassment. But my mother-in-law wasn't pleased and threatened. If you keep talking like that, you're no longer members of the block party. No more high-end steak after this. Is that what you want? Upon her threat, they said, that, That's too much. We love this community. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh... Rhina is my name? Yes, yes, uh, Rhina. Oh, we can't go against the president, they said. And the support they offered was quickly withdrawn by my mother-in-law. It seems she doesn't just control this house, but the whole area. There is no way I, a mere housewife, can win against this woman. The steak I had ordered arrived, and my mother-in-law began happily arranging it on the table. Since she had chosen the steak, it was surprisingly luxurious. The side dishes were a parade of high-end ingredients like caviar and truffles. But even here, my mother-in-law lectured me. You think you can eat such good steak as a wife? You're 100 years too early. You won't have any this time either. My mother-in-law bullied me openly in front of everyone. The pitiful glances from those around us pierced me. No one could oppose my mother-in-law. I glanced at my husband, who was quietly eating his steak alone. But surely, a little bit is fine, isn't it? I was envious of not being able to eat the steak and slightly resisted my mother-in-law. Of course it's not okay, but I'm not a demon. 
I bought beef noodles for you this time, so I'll give them to you, she said, handing me a serving of noodles. Upgraded from ordinary noodles to beef noodles? But what I wanted to eat was steak. I finally lost my patience and raised my voice. Mother-in-law, this is too much. I prepared everything for today's block party and yet you treat me like this? So is this true? You prepared all this by yourself, Rana? Lauren, couldn't you be a little kinder? With my words, everyone's eyes turned to my mother-in-law. You all better not get carried away. Or you'll be treated the same as this useless son's wife. My mother-in-law countered with determination. Everyone lost to my mother-in-law's intimidation and no one said anything back. Rhyna, you remember what I told you before. You must obey mother in this house. But then? My husband suddenly raised his voice. I was surprised by that voice and my body flinched. Obey mother's instructions quietly. The atmosphere became silent at my husband's words, and the people who had been supporting me eventually said, Yes, 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 Lauren is right. Filling the room with voices defending my mother-in-law, frustrated, I ran away from the scene and locked myself in my bedroom. I wonder how many hours had passed. It seems I had fallen asleep. When I realized the block party had dispersed, and it was night, when I looked at my mobile phone, there was an email from my son. Mom, I'm heading your way tomorrow. Apparently, my son was already in America staying in a hotel. I went back to sleep. The next morning, as I went to the living room, my mother-in-law was making breakfast. You really got carried away yesterday, didn't you? I'm sorry. I informed my mother-in-law who attacked me without even a greeting about my son. Oh, Leo, if he's coming back, we'll have steak today. It seems my mother-in-law, who hadn't seen my son since he went abroad for study, was eagerly looking forward to seeing him again. She had already ordered catering from our usual steakhouse. And then the evening came and my son returned home. The dinner table was laden with steaks, even more luxurious than usual. Leo, eat as much as you like. My mother-in-law was quite pleased. As always, I was treated like a servant. Uh, thank you, but where's mom's portion? My kind-hearted son noticed that there was no steak for me and was worried. At that question, my mother-in-law attacked. Oh, it's fine. Rhina is always like this. More importantly, try this. It's made with beef from Nebraska. My mother-in-law looked happy to be reunited with her grandson after such a long time. But my son responded with unexpected words. I don't want it. Why didn't you prepare mom's portion? This is discrimination, isn't it? He said coolly. My mother-in-law was startled by this unexpected reaction. My husband also looked at our son surprised. What are you talking about? Grandma, I have heard everything from mom. You really look down on her, don't you? My son, who had returned home, had grown up strong and confident more than I knew. Feeling antagonized by him, my mother-in-law began to panic. Oh, what? What did you hear? I didn't do anything. Grandma, you're mean, aren't you? What? What did you say? You're always looking down on mom, right? You want to feel superior, but people like that usually lack confidence or have nothing to be proud of. That's why they attack others to feel superior. It's a mean personality. Leo, just because you're a child doesn't mean you can say anything. Then what about a grandma who can't tell right from wrong? My son's counterattacks didn't stop and my mother-in-law was increasingly cornered. That's true, isn't it? Everyone has an equal share of stake, but mom has nothing? This is clear discrimination. Normally, this would lead to a fight. I have seen it happen many times. My son was looking at my mother-in-law with cold eyes, far beyond his years. Seeing those eyes, she became a little timid and quieted down. But my son's momentum did not stop. You're panicking. Your eye movements, habits, and amount of sweat tell the story. I'm studying psychology at Cambridge University, always at the top of my class, and I assist a professor every day. I see many types of people, and Grandma, you have a typical dictator personality. Me? A dictator? My mother-in-law seemed to have taken some damage, making a face. She probably never thought the day would come when her grandson would say such things. You're sweating a lot from the agitation. Are you panicking, Grandma? Maybe no one has ever spoken to you friendly before. That's... that's... 
My son was completely in control of the conversation's pace. I was simply watching the two of them. My husband was doing the same. But there is really nothing to it, is there? I wonder why everyone was so afraid. By the way, Grandma, do you have something you're good at? Good at? Uh, well... You were snapping at Mom even though you have no talents. That's not cool. Mom has some, though. That's... that's mean. Do you have to say that? My mother-in-law was gradually backed into a corner losing her ability to articulate. My son showed no mercy to her. Mean? What you did, Grandma, was far meaner. Plus, Mom is skilled in embroidery. It could even sell in England. I was surprised by my son's words. It was the first time my hobby was appreciated like this. So, what's your point? Don't you get it? Mom has skills beyond others, but you, Grandma, have none. Yet, you try to belittle Mom and assert dominance? Is it because you can't accept someone being superior knowing that you can't do anything? Grandma, you are the weakest here. My mother-in-law was at a loss for words, her mouth agape. She must have been struck by the undeniable truth. She couldn't say anything in return. And you, Dad? What have you been doing all this time? Why didn't you help Mom when she was struggling? Well, that's... You couldn't stand up to Grandma, could you? I don't know if it's because she's your mother, but if so, why did you marry Mom? My husband, too, was dumped by my son's legitimate questions and had no reply. Of everyone present, my son was the calmest and wisest. In the end, both you, Dad, and Grandma are just bullying Mom without any real content. You just want to feel superior and look down on others. I don't want to be involved with such people. My son's relentless words made my husband and mother-in-law's faces more rigid than ever before. Whether it was frustration at not being able to retort or something else, they tightly clenched their lips. My son's words hit home accurately and there was nothing they could do. I was simply delighted that my son had grown so wonderfully and I couldn't help but gaze at him. Then my son said to me, Mom, let's leave these two and move to England together. England? But we don't have the money and finding a job there will be tough. As I replied, my son, who had been serious until now, began to smile. Actually, one of my classmates has a father who's a Hollywood actor. I became friends with him and when I showed him pictures of your embroidery, he praised them. Then his father heard about it. Really? That's wonderful. My son continued. So his father wants to buy your work and the news has spread with over 200 people now waiting to buy your pieces. What? As I expressed my surprise, my mother-in-law and husband also listened to my son's story with astonished faces. My son went on. Uh, you know, Mom, I'm sorry for taking the liberty of arranging this, but they want you to open a store with your handmade crafts. The kid's dad will handle all the expenses, including the cost for relocation, so let's turn your hobby into a job in the UK. My son's eyes were sparkling with excitement. Indeed, for something I do as a hobby, people around me often praise my finished works. I never dreamed that this would become my job. And in England? No less, not America. I fell silent for a while, pondering. The three of them focused on me as I thought, Oh, Ryda, you're not really going, are you? You can be serious, right? My mother-in-law and husband asked me with frantic expressions. I thought hard about it. My son was right. If I'm going to be harassed at my in-law's house anyway, I want to make my hobby my job. Moreover, the already frosty relationship with my husband has worsened due to his cold attitude. I felt like I didn't need to be here anymore and I made up my mind. I'll give it a try. I accepted my son's proposal. My son was overjoyed at my answer and my mother-in-law and husband wore shocked expressions. I decided to say it plainly. That's it, I'm divorcing you. I'm tired of being with you and being oppressed by your mother. Let me be free. With that, my husband slumped and said, All right. My mother-in-law was ranting until the end, but I didn't catch any of it and don't remember. And so, the divorce was finalized without fuss and I was freed from my in-law's house. Now, I'm busy in England preparing to open a shop. I insisted on making all the products by hand. This may be the most fulfilling time in my life. Later, I heard from my son that right after I arrived in England, my former mother-in-law stumbled at the entrance and ended up in the hospital. When she was injured, my former husband didn't know what to do, so he called an ambulance, but as she was being carried away, she ranted and raved, her complaints echoing throughout the neighborhood. 
This incident led to the block party members finally distancing themselves from my former mother-in-law. Since they were merely members who had quietly obeyed under intimidation, there were no real friends around her. My son apparently still keeps in touch with my former husband. It seems my former husband is doing all the housework by himself since my former mother-in-law was hospitalized, and with increased expenses, he has started working a late-night part-time job. The two who had continued to torment me have now begun to fall in life. Considering my former mother-in-law's age, full recovery may be difficult and she may need care even after discharge. It's going to be tough, but I hope the two of them will do their best to live on. I am steadily working on products for the opening. My son is helping with the interior decoration of the shop next door. Although the idea of moving abroad was scary at first, my son is helping me wholeheartedly, which is very reassuring. My son, who rescued me from a painful in-law family. Now, as a mother, I will do my best to support my son as I finish the last piece. Starting today, we're looking after her. You can't have kids, so you must be thrilled, right? Three years into our marriage, my husband suddenly brought home his niece. To make matters worse, she was a result of his sister's affair. Deciding on his own to raise her at our home? That's the height of irresponsibility. I won't just go along with this. They won't get their way with me. My name is Priscilla. I'm 30. Living the typical life of a dual-income couple with my husband Randolph. We don't have any kids, not because of health issues, but financial reasons. We dream of buying our own home and must be careful with our financial planning. We have decided to wait until we have saved enough for a down payment and birth costs. Since Randolph usually gets home late, I always prepare dinner while waiting for him. I'm home, Priscilla. What a day. Welcome back. Dinner's almost ready. Go wash your hands. What's cooking? It smells amazing. It's your favorite meat sauce pasta. Really? I'll wash my hands right now. By the way, any chance for seconds? Of course, there's plenty. Awesome, I'll have three plates then. He always enjoys the dishes I make. The seasoning differs from what he's used to, but seeing him relish every bite makes me not care anymore. Our relationship with the in-laws is balanced, not too close, not too distant. But there is one shadow over our life, Randall's sister, Garnet. Five years younger than us, Garnet is a real piece of work. She looks sweet, but in reality, she's a flirt and not the nicest person. She's one of the worst people I have ever met. Lately, every time we meet, she belittles me. You probably weren't popular in school, were you? <laughs> Despite her rude question, I try to answer lightheartedly. <laughs> well, I was more into basketball in school, never really interested in dating. That's what unpopular people always say. Were you one of them? <laughs> it's not an excuse. I just wasn't interested in romance. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Clearly, you're not the popular type. <laughs> Garnet, uh, that's quite rude. But it's true, right? Got under your skin? <laughs> uh, enough of that. Let's drop it. You know, when I walk around town, I get scouted as a model. It's so hard to shop peacefully. Maybe I should take you as a bodyguard? Garnet always makes me her verbal punching bag. What's worse is that she acts without any remorse. The most stressful part is that my husband's family spoils her rotten. Both sets of parents and even my husband dote on her, letting her say whatever she pleases without any reprimand. Apparently, her beauty has always made her the family's darling. Her skin is as white as porcelain, her hair a fluffy platinum blonde and her body delicately petite, like a doll. As a result, she's always fawned over by everyone around her and has morphed into a rather arrogant monster. Just the other day, something happened when we visited my in-laws. My sister-in-law noticed a bag I had been using for years and laughed at it, pointing her finger. Wait, what's with your bag, sis? <laughs> uh, what? Is there something wrong with my bag? Isn't it a bit too worn out? How many years have you been using it? <laughs> well, it's been about three years, but I don't think it's all that worn out. The handle's color is fading a bit, isn't it? I would be too embarrassed to use it. Uh, I like this bag. I don't mind if it's a little worn out. I just keep using it because it's important to me. 
Upon hearing this, my sister-in-law burst out laughing, a smirk of contempt on her face. Sis, you must have become stingy because you don't get hit on, right? <laughs> what? What does that have to do with not getting hit on? At my irritation, she looked up at me, pouting her lips. It does matter if I want something, guys immediately buy it for me. But you don't have that, do you? Why would I... I wouldn't ask strangers to buy me personal items. I can do that because I'm popular. If I ask everyone will buy me anything, it's tough being so popular, but it's a blessing. At this, even I was at a loss for words. Then one day, I received an email from Garnet saying she wanted to talk about something and she visited our condo and then she uttered something utterly shocking. Hey sis, guess what? I'm dating a married man right now. What? A married man? He even has kids. Whoa, wait a minute. What are you saying? Isn't that pretty bad? Don't be so straightforward, sis. Everyone's cheating. It's not a big deal. That's not okay. And he even has a wife and kids. Stop nagging. I didn't come here to be lectured. I came here to brag about being hit on by a married man. What? What on earth is she saying? She said she had a problem and asked me to make time for her. What is this all about? She's not in trouble. She's bragging? I can't believe it. Garnet, cheating is not okay. You should end that relationship as soon as possible. Oh, well, I guess you wouldn't understand because you're not popular. What a waste of time. With that, she quickly left. Since then, I couldn't stand her and tried to avoid her as much as possible. It was six months later when my sister-in-law got pregnant with a child from the married man. I couldn't believe what my husband told me and had to ask him to repeat it several times. Huh? Garnet is pregnant with a child from the man she cheated with? You're kidding, right? Yeah, and her belly is already pretty big, so it seems uh, she has no choice but to give birth. But how will she raise it? And won't the man's wife demand compensation? She is already being demanded, but she says she's definitely going to have the baby. What? She didn't just cheat with a married man, she got pregnant too? My disgust for my sister-in-law was beyond control. My contempt deepened and I found myself unable to... Despite everything that's been going on, you feel sympathy? I can't believe it. One day, out of frustration, I confronted my husband. Listen, Randolph, this is really getting out of hand. Oh, uh, what's out of hand? Garnet, it's already bad enough she had an affair as a married woman, but why on earth aren't you scolding her for getting pregnant too? Scolding? Look, Garnet is struggling, isn't she? This is her first pregnancy and emotionally... My voice naturally rose against my husband's careless drowning. Struggling? That's not the point. Think about the other woman. She has a kid and her husband cheated on her and the woman he cheated... With is pregnant now, Garnet should certainly be remorseful, don't you think? Why are you so angry? Don't you feel sorry for Garnet at all, Priscilla? Sorry? Sorry for what? The one at fault is Garnet who had the affair, isn't it? That's enough. I didn't realize you would be so cold, Priscilla. What? Why am I the one being blamed here? The ones with messed up morals are my husband and his family, right? I continued to argue with my husband, but he wouldn't listen. I kept my distance from my sister-in-law and lived independently until... My husband suddenly said something outrageous. I've been thinking, uh, we should take in Garnet's baby. What? What are you talking about? How could you even think like that? Well, Garnet said, uh, you can take care of it if you want. We don't have kids of our own, so... That's not the point. Stop being so impulsive. Why have we been living a planned life till now? To my desperate pleas, my husband said something even more preposterous. After all, Garnet will be the one giving birth, so it won't put any burden on you, Priscilla. Plus, if Garnet were to get married to someone else, the child would be a nuisance, wouldn't it? What? Anyways, this decision is final. Start preparing to welcome a child, alright? The cruelty of my husband's casual words filled me with fear. He's serious? We are supposed to take care of a child conceived through my sister-in-law's affair? It's fine just because we don't have kids? That's absurd. My distrust and disgust towards my husband only grew day by day. Living together was starting to feel unbearable. My in-laws who did nothing to school my sister-in-law said this to me. 
Well, uh, Garnett is young and attractive. She could get married to another man in the future. Considering that, it's best for you and Randall to raise Garnett's child. Yeah, Garnett's child would surely be adorable whoever raises it. It's still our grandchild after all. I panicked and put a stop to my in-laws' excited rambling. Wait, wait. Are you serious? I don't plan to... Well, aren't you infertile, Priscilla? Is there any problem? You've been married for quite a while now and haven't gotten pregnant. It's lucky that Garnet could have a baby for you. Or are you just jealous that Garnet is pregnant? What? Jealous? For the record, I'm not infertile. We have planned to start trying for a baby after considering things like buying a house. Even my husband, who should have been on my side, joined in the ridicule. Hey, Priscilla, jealousy isn't a good look. I am not jealous. So you're just upset your little sister beat you to it, huh? What? The family's ethics are beyond my comprehension. A few weeks later, my sister-in-law gives birth to the married man's child and my husband comes home holding the newborn. With a wide smile, he tells me, We're going to take care of this baby from now on. You? You're kidding, right? Despite everything I said, you actually brought the baby home? Come on, aren't you happy, Priscilla? You can't have kids after all. Stop it. I told you I am not infertile. We agreed to wait until we have saved enough money. But didn't I also tell you that jealousy isn't a good look? Stop envying Garnet. Can't be helped, right? Unlike you, Garnet is cute and attractive. In that moment, my anger reached its peak. I can't be in a marriage with this man anymore. I tell my husband calmly, If you want to take care of that child so badly, then do it on your own. On my own? He quickly raises an eyebrow. Who do you think you are? I took in the child for you too. For me? Stop joking. I refused countless times. Despite that, you brought the child home anyway. How is that for me? Enough. If you are going to refuse this child so much, we're getting a divorce. Perfect. Because that's what I want too. I can't be married to someone like you anymore. I pulled out the divorce papers I had prepared in advance and he signs them looking like a demon. There, I signed it. Are you happy now? Thank you. I'll follow these then. As I gather my belongings to leave, he throws the divorce papers at me. You're so stubborn and not cute at all. Have fun living a lonely life. Living a lonely life? I wonder who's really going to end up like that. Barely suppressing a grin, I leave the house I had lived in for so many years. After our divorce, my ex-husband apparently moved out of our condominium to live with his parents. His parents were overjoyed to be able to live off their son's income and quickly quit their jobs. He must have been very happy to be relied upon by his parents as he was determined to work hard for his parents and daughter. One day, I unexpectedly run into my friend Shirley while walking in the city. She works at the same company as my ex-husband, so she already knows about our divorce. I was quite shocked by the truth she told me. Wait, he's saying I cheated? Yeah, he has been saying at work that he found out you were cheating while you were pregnant, that the baby might not even be his. Everyone's been feeling really sorry for him. Why did you tell me, Priscilla? Hold on a second. I didn't cheat and I didn't even have a baby. Wait, what do you mean? I explained everything to Shirley. Upon hearing this, Shirley became furious, turned bright red and promised to tell everyone the truth at work. My ex-husband, cornered by Shirley, frantically tried to make excuses. Randolph, how dare you spread lies about Priscilla cheating? What? Uh, I never lied. Your daughter? She's not Priscilla's daughter, is she? She's your sister's child. Your sister is the one who cheated and you decided to take the child all by yourself. Priscilla was so disgusted she left you. That's the truth, isn't it? No, 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 no. Priscilla was the one no, who cheated. My sister had nothing to do with it. Oh, really? Well, shall we call Priscilla now? It will be easy to confirm if she gave birth. Oh, well... Shirley quickly exposed my ex-husband's lies. He faced heavy criticism from everyone at the company. Ultimately, he was summoned by his boss, leading him to lose his place in the company and resign. With no income, his parents quickly turned cold and it seemed like he was on the verge of being kicked out of their home. In a sudden change of heart, he reached out to me. Priscilla, I was wrong. Please help me. When I answered the phone, my feelings were icy cold. Help you? What are you talking about now? I'll leave Garnel's child at home, so please, let's try again. 
I was utterly fed up with him. Still spouting convenient things in this situation, as if to vent all the resentment I had been holding, I poured out my feelings onto him. Enough. Who are you to say help me or let's try again? It's too late to be so shameless. Who do you think ended our marriage? It was all your own selfish decisions. I'm, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll apologize. So please forgive me. Why would I forgive you, you idiot? A senseless man like you? I reject you. Not having a child was the best decision. Thank you for allowing me to divorce you without any regrets. Calm down, hey! I will never forgive you. I have no intention of having anything to do with you again. Whatever happens to you, I don't care. Just fall, you fool. After letting out everything I wanted to say, I hung up the phone. In that moment, I blocked his number. According to rumors, my ex-husband begged his parents and they let him stay in their house under the condition he covers his own living expenses. However, he was unable to secure another job and in desperation resorted to borrowing money from an illegal lender with exorbitant interest rates. Now his whole family lives in fear of debt collectors. My former sister-in-law also faced troubles as the wife of the man she cheated with demanded a large sum of money as compensation. Her friends discovered her affair and she quickly lost their respect. Having had an affair with a married man and dumped the child on her real brother, she is now struggling without any men around her. Meanwhile, I rented a condominium near my workplace and have been enjoying my single life. I used to think that I couldn't imagine a life without a husband, but now I genuinely believe that it was a good thing to divorce. If I ever get involved with someone again, I want to avoid making the same mistakes. To grab my own happiness, I am determined to discern people properly. My name is Emily. I'm 30 and currently pregnant. When I was 23, I was diagnosed with a condition that might prevent me from ever having children. For my younger self, that diagnosis was a heavy burden to bear. I feared that any potential romantic partners would reject me if they knew I might not be able to have children. So, I stayed away from relationships. But then last year, I reconnected with Logan at our high school reunion. Logan confessed that he'd had feelings for me since high school and asked to exchange contact information at the reunion. Logan expressed his affection for me with such persistence and strength that I found myself growing attracted to him, too. I had been honest with Logan about my potential inability to have children. But Logan said he still wanted to marry me, and so we tied the knot last year. Then, like a miracle, I found out that I was pregnant with Logan's child. I was so thrilled that I showed Logan the ultrasound picture I received from the obstetrician that very day. Logan cried with joy at the news of my pregnancy and seeing his tears made me cry too. I resolved to cherish and protect the life growing inside me. I decided to bring this child in the world and raise it with all my love. A few days later, I found myself heading back to my parents' house alone. Logan couldn't come because of work, but I wanted to tell my mom about the pregnancy as soon as possible. My mother had comforted me when I was diagnosed with potential infertility, assuring me that a life without children could also be wonderful. She was also the first to celebrate when Logan and I decided to get married. My father passed away when I was very young, and my mom single-handedly raised my brother and me. My father had a good salary and left a sizable inheritance, but my mom continued to work until her retirement. My mom now lives alone in a house, leading an elegant life. She goes to the hobby club every day, tends to her garden, and even makes trendy do-it-yourself shelves, truly savoring her life. I was sure mom would be overjoyed at the news of my pregnancy. As I arrived at my parents' house with high hopes, mom greeted me with a smile. Welcome home, Emily. Ryan and his family are here today. I knew from the voices of my nieces that my brother's family was visiting. Though I'm not particularly fond of my sister-in-law, my eagerness to share my pregnancy news with mom had me entering the house nonetheless. From my perspective, my brother's wife, Chloe, can be a bit nasty. 
Chloe, who married my brother Ryan seven years ago, made a remark I still can't forget when I was feeling down about being diagnosed with potential infertility. If you can't have children, maybe you should give up on getting married, she said seriously. When I announced my marriage to Logan, she made things even more uncomfortable by saying things like, how much did you get from your mother-in-law as a wedding gift? What's the point of getting married if you can't even have children? It was a bitter experience, but creating a rift with Chloe, who is my brother's wife, would do no good. I had always brushed off Chloe's commands with a wry smile and never told mum about them. As I entered the house with mum, my nieces were happily playing pretend, while Ryan and Chloe were sitting at the table drinking coffee. After greeting my brother and his wife, I took a seat at the table and mum poured me a cup of coffee as well. I was hesitant about sharing my pregnancy news with Chloe, but I thought she might not say anything unpleasant if I announced it in front of mum, so I gathered my courage and began to speak. I actually came here today because I have some news to share. I... I am pregnant. As I gently rubbed my stomach and announced the news, mum exclaimed, Really? Chloe muttered a quiet, you got to be kidding. And my brother shouted, Congratulations! I know you were worried about potentially being unable to get pregnant, Emily. I am so glad for you. Logan really is your destiny. Congratulations! Mom just have been incredibly happy as she began to shed tears of joy. Remembering how mom had supported me when I was feeling down, I too started tearing up. But I noticed Chloe whispering something to Ryan and that got my attention. Repeatedly thanking mom as I gently wrapped her back. Mom finally seemed to calm down and told me with a warm smile, you must take care of yourself. Just then, the doorbell rang as if on cue. Oh, I wonder if that's a package delivery. I'll be right back. As soon as mum was out of the room, heading towards the entrance, Chloe leaned in and started speaking to me. Is it true that you're pregnant? You said you might be not able to get pregnant. Was it a lie to gain sympathy from our mother-in-law? Huh? Caught off guard by her unexpected accusation, I could only stare at her in surprise, while my brother feigned ignorance. Seeing no help coming, I firmly responded, No, that's not true. It's true that the doctors told me I might not be able to get pregnant, even the doctors were surprised that I could, and my husband was overjoyed, I explained. You should consider terminating the pregnancy. What? It's better to do it sooner. I heard it's less stressful on the body. The horrifying words coming from Chloe made me shudder. Instinctively, I hugged myself as if to protect my unborn child. How could anyone say such a thing to someone who's excited about their pregnancy? I couldn't believe we were the same species. Even my brother seemed shocked by her statement. Hey, that's a bit harsh, isn't it? He defended me. But Chloe glared at him and continued. But if Emily has a baby, our mother-in-law will definitely spend her money on that child. It's obvious that she would love her own daughter's child more. I can't stand the thought of our children getting less money. So, you are telling me to abort my child because of money? I didn't say abort. I suggested that it might be better. Who knows if a child carried by a mother who might not even be able to get pregnant can be born healthy? I'm just thinking about what's best for your baby too, Emily. I was certain her claim of considering my child's well-being was a complete lie. Chloe was pushing me to abort my child out of fear that she would receive less financial support from our mother-in-law. She was always dressed in designer clothes, and her two daughters were the same high-end fashion. Moreover, she and my brother lived in a large house and drove an expensive foreign car. I knew my brother worked at a sizable company and earned a good salary, but I couldn't imagine it would be enough for such luxuries. 
Though it was hard to believe, I deduced from our conversation that my brother and his wife were receiving a significant amount of money from our mother-in-law. I have no intention of receiving financial support from mom. Please stop suggesting that I should terminate. The baby can hear you. Chloe snorted at my words. There's no way the baby can hear, she retorted with a mean expression on her face. To me, she looked like a devil. When my mom returned, my brother and his wife suddenly became restless. It quickly became clear that they were afraid I would tell my mother about their behavior. Since it's almost lunchtime, should we order takeout? Ah, that sounds great! Let's have pizza, pizza! Pizza sounds nice! I think I'll head home. I'm feeling a bit tired. I was frustrated with my brother and his wife for planning to splurge on lunch. But more than that, I was feeling suffocated sharing the same space with Chloe. As I stood up and explained my mom that I didn't want to impose, she looked concerned and asked, Are you sure you're okay? I just smiled and nodded before leaving. That night, when Logan came home, I told him about what had happened, my mood still low. Logan was furious with Chloe. I'm going to call her and give her a piece of my mind right now, he fumed. But I stopped him. If we, who were relatives after all, started a fight with Chloe, it would cause unnecessary trouble for my mom. However, I couldn't stand seeing my mom being treated like a cash cow by Chloe. I decided to report today's events to her. A few days later, once I confirmed that my brother and his wife weren't visiting, I went to my mom's home and explained the situation. She smiled warmly. I've known that Ryan and Chloe have been depending on my money, she said. Just the other day, Chloe said she needed an outfit for a ballet recital. I thought it was for my granddaughter, but I was shocked when I ended up buying clothes for Chloe. But don't worry. I have no intention of forgiving a daughter-in-law who says such things to my sweet daughter and a son who doesn't stop her. Our always gentle mom was quietly furious. A few days later, my mom summoned both us and my brother's family to her home. Dressed in brand name clothes as usual, Chloe arrived with my brother. After giving us, casually dressed as always, a thorough once over, Chloe dramatically tilted her head. Even if it's just your family home, is that outfit okay? If you need clothes, I can give you some of our hand-me-downs. We like our clothes. We are not into flashy clothes like you, Chloe. When Logan gave her a straight answer, Chloe huffled. I see, and sat down grumpily. I knew Logan was angry when my mom called us, saying, Emily doesn't need to talk to Chloe anymore. He probably wanted to protect me from Chloe. Just as I was feeling grateful for having married such a dependable husband, my mom entered the room with a man. He was the accountant who had helped my father when he was the president of his company. It was revealed that he was here to talk about my mom's plans for old age and inheritance. I'm the eldest son, and in return for taking care of our mother in her old age, I'll receive all the inheritance. That's only fair. I'll take good care of our mother-in-law. If a demon like you were to take care of me, I'd die early. I'm preparing to move into a home for the elderly, so don't worry. With that, she handed out pamphlets for the nursing home to both us and my brother's family. We were surprised to learn that my mom was planning to move into a nursing home, but what shocked us even more were her words to Chloe. Chloe seemed stunned too. She froze for the moment, then murmured in a trembling voice, Th That's harsh. It hurts to hear you say that when I care so much for you, and I was hurt too, to hear Chloe tell my precious daughter to abort her baby. Why would you? But Chloe glared at me. I glared back. I reported everything to mom. You tattled on me? 
Chloe's voice rise in anger and Logan just shrugged his shoulders. Well, maybe you shouldn't have said something that would cause trouble if it were reported, Logan countered. It's only natural for Emily to tell our mother-in-law if you said something like that. Ignoring Chloe, who was gritting her teeth in frustration, my mom said, now let's get back to the matter at hand. As for the distribution of my inheritance, I've decided that all my assets will go to Emily after my death. What? Why, mom? I'm your eldest son. According to our tax consultant, all of the gifts you received from me during my lifetime should count. My older brother and Chloe, bewildered, could only stare blankly as the tax consultants took out several documents from a file. One by one, my mum laid them out on the table. The cost of your wedding, your honeymoon, down payment on your house and car. I lent you the money for all of this with the understanding that you would pay me back, but I haven't received a cent in return. The documents laid out on the table were all loan agreements. Each one detailed how much was borrowed from mom and what for. At the end of each document were the clear signatures of my older brother and Chloe. I've decided not to request repayment for these loans. Instead. I will count them as gifts made during my lifetime. This way, by leaving the remainder of my estate to Emily, I'm making sure everything is equal. You're joking. Next to him, Chloe went after mom. But mom, you're going to be spending money on Emily's child from now on, aren't you? Your own daughter's child has to be more precious to you. Isn't that also a gift made during your lifetime? She wants me to use my money solely to enjoy the rest of my life. Therefore, from now on, I will only be giving gifts to my grandchild on special occasions. Chloe seemed far from satisfied, but as the tax consultant calmly explained the property distribution, she seemed to have run out of objections. My older brother, realizing he would not be receiving an inheritance, looked deeply disappointed. The mood in the room was tense and somber. However, I felt a strong sense of relief knowing that mom wouldn't be treated like a cash machine any longer. After this discussion, my older brother and Chloe stopped visiting our mother's house. So they really did only see me as a wallet, huh? But after my child was born, I started visiting home more often. Whenever she was able to play with her grandchild, she seemed truly happy. Even without the money, just seeing mom shower my child with love was more than enough for me. I later heard from mom that Chloe used to mock us for both having jobs. Chloe, who had been a stay-at-home wife, apparently used to make comments like Emily and her husband are just poor, so they have to work. But now, she works much longer hours than me to pay for the house and car loans and for her kids' extracurricular activities. Living a lifestyle beyond her means, counting on mom's wallet, she now has no choice but to work as she can't bring herself to lower her standard of living. Ever since she started working, she's been increasingly irritable. Mum says that my brother has been calling more frequently to vent about Chloe. Struggling to balance housework, child rearing and work, their home is always in a mess and there seems to be no end to their problems. I've heard that my brother is even considering divorce. Right now, my husband and I are pouring our love into our child that came us like a miracle. Of course, we don't receive any support from mom, so we are working on hard to save for our child's future education. Despite the busy days, just seeing our child smile makes us feel, let's do our best again tomorrow. I can only hope that my brother and Chloe will adopt to a lifestyle within their means and be able to sustain their marriage. I'm Mia, 28 years old. 
I married Oliver five years ago. We don't have children yet because of our busy work lives. Oliver and I met through a friend's introduction and we hit it off right away. Half a year later, we got married. Oliver works as a salaryman for a local company. The company isn't very large, so Oliver's salary is moderate. As for our home, my father-in-law spontaneously bought us a luxurious high-rise apartment when we got married. Unfortunately, he passed away suddenly from a heart attack and Oliver suggested to his mother, my mother-in-law, that she should move in with us. One day, Oliver came home from work to find mother-in-law at our place. He exclaimed joyfully, Living with mom? Yes, here's my paycheck. It was payday at Oliver's company, so he happily handed the pay stub to mother-in-law. Mother-in-law accepted the pay stub with polite gratitude. Eventually, mother-in-law moved into the high-rise apartment and Oliver's days seemed to become filled with joy as they started living together. About three months after our marriage, I noticed something. Mother-in-law was incredibly obsessed with cleanliness to the point of being a neat freak. If a speck of dust fell on the dining table, she would be so upset that she would stop eating and this happened more than once. If there was even one hair in the bathtub, it would cause a commotion and she would demand that the water be completely replaced. At first, I was puzzled by mother-in-law's obsession with cleanliness but now I have gotten used to it and I know what to be careful about so I feel more at ease. Mother-in-law is very strict with me but very kind to my husband Oliver. When Oliver comes home from work, mother-in-law waits for him at the front door, taking his bag as soon as he opens the door. Then she asks, Do you want to shower first or have dinner? If Oliver says he wants to shower first, mother-in-law promptly prepares a towel and a change of clothes and even joins him in the bathroom to wash his back. Then, she dries him with a towel when he comes out of the bath. About dinner, mother-in-law had something to tell me when she started living with us. I know all about Oliver's likes and dislikes, so I'll be the one to make Oliver's food. After my mother-in-law said that, I no longer had to make Oliver's meals. As days went by, I felt more and more out of place. Oliver was always concerned about his mother's mood and he stopped talking to me as much. One day, I asked Oliver, Oliver, who do you value more, me or your mom? What kind of silly question is that? Of course, both of you are important. I don't feel that way. Don't worry about it. A few days later, I saw something I wasn't supposed to. I was doing all the laundry, but mother-in-law was hand-washing her clothes again after I had washed them. She must think my washing doesn't get the dirt out. I was so shocked that I asked mother-in-law, Mother-in-law, are you unhappy with my laundry? Oh, you saw me? It's not that I am dissatisfied, but I prefer to wash them myself. Then can you put your laundry in a separate basket next time? I won't touch anything in that basket. My, what an impertinent daughter-in-law. Oliver must feel so sorry to have you as a wife. Uh, why would he feel sorry? Please explain clearly. Enough of this. I don't want to talk to a daughter-in-law like you. I understand. That night, I planned to talk to Oliver about mother-in-law when he got home, but as usual, mother-in-law was waiting at the entrance and they went straight to the shower together. In the bathroom, I heard mother-in-law talking excitedly, probably bad-mouthing me. Oliver came out, glanced at me, but said nothing and had dinner with his mother. After dinner, as soon as Oliver and I went into the bedroom, he burst out, Mia, I heard you said terrible things to mom. Why are you bullying her? I never said anything terrible and I am not bullying her. Mom was crying earlier. She said you were bullying her. Oliver, you only believe what mother-in-law says, not me. Hey, hey, don't get cheeky. I believe mom. If you don't want to live with her, you should leave. At that moment, I felt that our marriage was a failure. And I was thinking of getting divorced if something triggered it. No, I was waiting for something to trigger it. About a month later, I was cleaning the room one morning. As I was cleaning around the bed, I found a lot of thrash. I was puzzled but removed it. That's when it happened. I felt someone's presence and looked towards the door to see mother-in-law standing there. She must have been watching how I cleaned. Sure enough, mother-in-law started. Your cleaning just makes the room dirtier and you seem to ignore what's under the bed. I hadn't really paid attention to what was under the bed, so when I looked, there was a mess of thrash. The sort that we wouldn't normally use, I picked up one of the thrash and showed it to mother-in-law asking, Mother-in-law, what is this thrash? 
We don't have this kind of thrash in our house. Mother-in-law responded with an angry face. What's with that tone? It's like you're accusing me of bringing that thrash in from outside and throwing it under the bed. I was, indeed, thinking that it was exactly like that, but without evidence, I couldn't say it out loud. I'm not accusing you, I'm just saying that I found trash that I haven't seen before. You are always so defiant. Can't you simply apologize for not cleaning properly? I don't think I need to apologize that much. Oh, how dreadful. A daughter-in-law defying her mother-in-law. The world is coming to an end. I'm not defying you. If I were Oliver, I would kick out a daughter-in-law like you. Poor Oliver. At that moment, I was so glad to hear those words which I had been waiting for. Understood. I'll do as mother-in-law says. I'll leave now. Mother-in-law seemed a bit surprised by those words. I continued, since I'm a terrible wife for Oliver, I'll divorce him. Mother-in-law said with a pleased face, Oh, really? That's too bad. Oliver will miss you. I guess so, but I feel relieved. That's when I decided to divorce Oliver. That night, when Oliver came home from work, he and mother-in-law were whispering in the bathroom as usual. When Oliver came out, he said to me, I heard from mom that you want to divorce me. I don't mind, but are you sure? You don't love me. I can't live with you anymore. All right, I understand. I'll take care of all the divorce procedures. For some reason, Oliver wanted to finish the process quickly. You don't have to worry, I won't demand alimony. That's a given, that's my line. The next day, I packed my belongings and left the luxurious high-rise apartment. Thinking back, my mother-in-law and husband were conspiring to kick me out of the upscale apartment. They must both be satisfied. I visited a friend from college after being kicked out. Amy glanced at my luggage and said, Uh, Mia, did you leave your house? <laughs> you caught me. I could tell right away by your luggage. My friend was still single, so I asked to stay for a while. Uh, sorry, but can I stay here for a bit? Of course, you can stay as long as you want. Thank you. I truly felt the importance of having a best friend. Since she helped me when I was in trouble, I made a mental promise to help Amy if she ever needed it. The following week, I had to go to the high-rise apartment. I got a call from mother-in-law saying that my signature was needed on the divorce papers. I didn't want to go, but since it was a signature for the divorce papers, I reluctantly left. When I arrived at the high-rise apartment, mother-in-law and Oliver seemed overly pleased about having driven me out. It felt like they were gloating. Oh, Mia, it's been a while. You look well. Mother-in-law was speaking in a way that made my teeth great. Oliver was smiling, saying something he had never said to me before. Mia, how are you? Always take care of yourself. Their words gave me a chill. I have brought the signed divorce papers. Oliver, please sign them and submit them. Goodbye. I was about to go home, but mother-in-law said, Mia, don't hurry home. Stay and relax. Yeah, stay and eat something. Actually, the meal is already prepared. It's your favorite. Reluctantly, I stayed for a meal at Oliver's home, thinking that if Oliver and mother-in-law had been this attentive before, we would never have divorced. Mother-in-law and Oliver didn't seem to want me to leave even after dinner. I had a bad feeling. I felt like there was some ulterior motive and my suspicion was confirmed. Mother-in-law said, By the way, Mia, Oliver's company has gone bankrupt and we have lost our income. About the compensation money in the divorce case. I felt like I understood the reason for today's unusual kindness when mother-in-law mentioned the compensation money in the divorce. We agreed to waive the compensation money in the divorce case, didn't we? I didn't say that. I didn't hear that conversation either. No, you definitely said it when I said I wouldn't claim the compensation money in the divorce. Oliver said it was obvious and that was his line. I don't know what you're talking about. Do you have evidence? I thought these two are no good. Now they want the compensation money from the divorce and are going back on their previous promise. Reluctantly, I took two documents from my bag. They were the pay stubs of Oliver and me just before we separated. I had taken them with me when I left the high-rise apartment just in case. Here are Oliver's and my pay stubs. Please take a close look. My salary written on those two pay stubs was more than twice Oliver's. 
The company I worked for was very strict, but the salary was very good, and my college friends were envious. So what? Do you want to brag about your salary by showing us this? You are such a rotten woman, Oliver. It's good that you divorced her. Say what you want, but as you can see from these pay stubs, almost all the living expenses were covered by my salary. What are you trying to say? Moreover, Oliver spent all his salary on himself. What's wrong with me spending my own money? Is what this woman saying true, Oliver? Oliver just makes a face as if he's bitten into something bitter and says nothing. What I want to say is that Oliver has never supported me financially as a husband. We were getting by on your salary, so what's wrong with that? No, it's not okay. Oliver, I asked you before to contribute some of your salary to our living expenses, didn't I? I don't know. That's right. Just like now, Oliver pretended not to know. Oliver, answer properly. If you respond like that, you will lose to this woman. And there's one more thing, probably something even mother-in-law doesn't know. What is it? Tell me. Oliver has a large debt from payday loans and the like, right? As I said this, Oliver clicked his tongue and looked away. Mother-in-law said, What about it, Oliver? Do you really have debt? Answer me. Oliver, still looking away, answered, Yeah, but I'll win it back with horse racing and pay it all off, so it's no problem. Oliver, how much debt do you have? Well, if I sell this high-rise apartment, it's enough to wipe out the debt. Oh, Oliver, how could you? Mother-in-law started crying at that. How about selling this high-rise apartment for your beloved Oliver, mother-in-law? Mother-in-law didn't answer and was only crouched down crying. I have no intention of paying compensation in a divorce trial to someone who hasn't cooperated with me in our married life. My debt and compensation in the divorce trial are different matters. No, they're not separate matters. If Oliver and mother-in-law are unhappy, please take it to court. I don't intend to lose. Then mother-in-law said to me, Mia, please help Oliver, I beg you. And mother-in-law deeply apologized to me. Mother-in-law, please lift your face. Don't do that in front of me, it's unseemly. You're really a cold woman. Do you enjoy bullying an old person? I am not bullying mother-in-law, I'm just telling the truth. Just leave, don't ever come back here again. I said to Oliver with a faint smile, Even without being told, I have no intention of coming back here again. Besides, I might have to sell this high-rise apartment to pay off the debt. Shut up, just leave. Oliver said excitedly, and I went home as if fleeing. After about two months had passed, Oliver's high-risk apartment was put up for sale as expected, and it seemed a buyer had been found. Mother-in-law and Oliver moved to an apartment near the high-risk building. Mother-in-law worked as a cleaner at a nearby hotel, and Oliver found a job at a nearby transport company working hard every day. I found out thanks to my friend who checked for me. Now, I'm working hard, of course, but I have found another passion. I met a wonderful man at a coffee shop after work. He is very kind and always listens to my opinions fully. But this time, I'm not planning to get married easily. Having failed in marriage with Oliver, I'm thinking about carefully assessing my partner before marrying again. That said, we have been seeing each other almost every day recently. Meeting with him daily feels like it's recharging my energy for work. Today, since both of us have a day off from work, we are planning to visit the model room of a high-rise apartment. I want to live in a high-rise apartment overlooking the sea with him, sipping coffee on the living room sofa while gazing at the ocean. He says he wants to see the sunrise every day. And someday, I think I would like to have a baby with him.